Hi, I'm Don from Don Drones On. Welcome to Module 4 of Don's Drone Rules. This is my proposal for a comprehensive set of practical rules, globally applicable and sensibly balanced. If you haven't already done so, I strongly encourage you to watch my introductory video. There's a link in the top corner. Otherwise, you'll be confused about what I'm talking about. In this module, I'll talk about basic operating rules, some practical safety rules in the real world. Let's get into it. A quick reminder that these proposed rules are for discussion purposes only. They're not real. Please understand and follow the real regulations for your country. Operating rules is the fourth and final module of Don's drone rules. And in this module, we'll start with basic safety and civil rules, spend a considerable amount of time on various elements of situational awareness, flying beyond visual range, autonomous functions, and wind up with RC aircraft clubs. Rather than a multitude of very specific rules like you see in the Canadian regulations today, what I tried to design into this section were fairly high level regulations that were clear enough that you could easily distinguish whether or not a particular activity you were doing was right or wrong. And the first two are good representations of that. They align perfectly with my principles that I introduced in the introductory module here. So number one, drone pilots must not fly in such a manner as to put manned aircraft at risk. And drone pilots must not fly in such a manner to put people on the ground at risk of injury. This third item, again, is aligned with my principles. The drone pilot must be fit to operate the drone with the same requirements regarding alcohol and drug usage as applies to motor vehicle operations. Not the same as what applies to a manned aircraft pilot, but what applies to driving a car. Now these last four cover kind of a broad range of topics. So let's get into these. Uh, the drone pilot must not interfere with others' right to privacy. And that, of course, will be quite different from one country to the next, but I thought it was an important item to cover explicitly. Next, drone pilots must not harass people or animals with their drone. Drone pilots must not use their drone to aid criminal activities. And lastly, drone pilots must not equip their drone with dangerous or hazardous payloads. So these are fairly high level, but at the same time, I think they're very clear about what's right and what's wrong. Situational awareness is critical for good, safe operation. And so I've got five specific items that tie into situational awareness that we're gonna go through now. The basic notion is this, that the pilot is expected to have full situational awareness by taking appropriate measures to both prepare for and execute a safe flight. And the five areas that I want to cover here are as follows. The pilot must have sufficient knowledge of the physical environment for a safe flight. The pilot should ensure that the weather conditions are appropriate for a safe flight. Third thing, the pilot must ensure that the drone itself is in safe operating condition. Fourth, the pilot must maintain a clear line of sight to the area of the operation. And lastly, the pilot must be prepared for both abnormal and emergency situations. Let's get into the details of each one of those areas. When it comes to the physical environment, the pilot must have sufficient knowledge of the physical environment for a safe flight, which means the following things. The pilot must understand the location of airports, heliports, and other aerodromes in the vicinity of the flight. They have to have an understanding of all airspace restrictions applicable for the vicinity of the flight, including any temporary restrictions that might be in place. The pilot needs an understanding of any local drone use restrictions for public land, such as parks, whether you're allowed to fly um, or take off from a park, for example. The pilot is expected to have an awareness of obstacles or hazards in the vicinity of the flight, including buildings, towers, cables, trees, sources of electromagnetic interference potentially. 
And lastly, the pilot is expected to know the location of bystanders when the flight is initiated and also be aware of locations where bystanders are likely to be during the flight. So pathways, bikeways, that kind of thing. So the, the pilot is responsible for knowing about the physical environment that they're flying in and also anticipating situations that could come up as a result of that. This next section is fairly straightforward and logical. It's regarding the situational awareness of weather conditions. The pilot must ensure that the weather conditions are appropriate for a safe flight, which means that he or she must understand the current weather and the forecast weather conditions for the duration of the flight, including the potential impact of what they call space weather, and in particular the KP index for geomagnetic storms. And in that regard, the pilot is expected to be aware of the drone's specifications with regard to weather conditions. So it's one thing to know that, yeah, the temperature is going to be minus five, but is it safe to fly your drone at that temperature? That requires an understanding of your drone's specifications. And note that I've worded this ruling not that you can't fly when you're outside the specs. So if it's minus five and your drone is, uh, uh, drone's safe flying uh, limitations are only above zero degrees, for example, that doesn't mean you can't fly. It means that you have to be aware of that and take that into account in your flight. So anticipate that your battery duration will be lower and that sort of thing. The drone pilot must ensure the drone is in safe operating condition which means no damage or wear that could result in loss of control during flight. You've got all your batteries charged up for all the pieces of your, of your system. And any payload or attachments like filters and stuff like this are secure and within the drone specifications, so you're not exceeding the payload weight. This next item is about software updates. And you'll notice that I'm not saying that you have to have your software up to date to the absolute latest one, because you might not want to do that for one reason or another. What I'm saying is that in the occasion where there is a mandatory software update from the manufacturer for some, you know, rather fatal issue, for example, um, you must have that up to date in, in your system. And lastly, safety systems like FlySafe maps must be enabled and must not be bypassed. I'm not talking about safety systems like obstacle avoidance because there are scenarios where you want to turn those off. I'm talking about systems that are designed to make your flight safe for aircraft and people on the ground. Okay, now we come to the doozy, line of sight. Well, I'll come right out and say it. I don't think the visual line of sight rule, the first commandment of drone rules in all countries, makes any sense. And I'd be willing to bet that the vast majority of drone flyers regularly do not have VLOS to their drones for a big portion of their flights. Why is that? Well, because drones are small. So if you take your eyes off it to look at what's on your flight display, even for a second, it will take you forever to spot your drone again, if you can at all. And if you aren't watching your display a lot, you won't know what your altitude is, you won't be able to smoothly control your camera, and you'll have a terrible flight. And yet, these same drone operations are safe. Now, how can that be? Well, I'm calling it on the VLOS rule and recommending something far more sensible and practical, and so ultimately more safe. Here's what I'm recommending. That instead of visual line of sight to the drone, the space where the drone is operating must always be within visual line of the pilot or visual observer to ensure that the pilot can anticipate and or respond immediately in the event of an aircraft or bystanders in the vicinity. Visual line of sight to the actual drone is not required. Still recommended, but not required. And binoculars and other visual enhancement devices, sure, use them to periodically check the airspace if it makes sense, particularly if you have a visual observer. And cameras or other sensors on the drone itself may assist the pilot or crew in maintaining situa situational awareness. I think they really help. 
And FPV goggles, which obscure your entire external vision, they may be used providing either a visual observer is present or if there are no bystanders present in the flight area. It all makes sense, it's easy. So there you go, visual line of sight out the door, visual line of sight to the space is the key. Finally, in this area, operations at night are perfectly fine as long as the drone has lights on it that you can see with your naked eye. That way you can tell where it is and you can tell where it is with respect to other objects in the area. This last section in the situational awareness category is a little bit tough to, to explain. It's about preparedness. The pilot must be prepared for abnormal flight conditions and emergency situations. What I mean by this is that the pilot is required to anticipate and be prepared to take appropriate actions in the event of abnormal conditions or emergency situations. Things like the entry or even possible entry of a manned aircraft into the flight area, the entry of bystanders into the flight area, sudden change in weather conditions, or the loss of control of the drone, for example, a flyaway. Now, why did I include this as a regulation that you have to anticipate things? Well, it's all about well, it, it's about the opposite of being negligent. You have to be prepared for things to go wrong in order to be able to fly safely. You have to anticipate. You have to uh, at least give some amount of thought into what you're going to do if you do actually see an aircraft in the flight area. Are you gonna land immediately? Are you gonna drop in altitude? Is it safe to do so? All that kind of stuff. So that's why I included preparedness as the last element, maybe it should have been the first element, of situational awareness. 4.3 is flying beyond visual range. Pilots with advanced or professional pilot certification, so not the basic, but the advanced or professional, may fly in areas beyond visual range by applying to the regulatory agency for an exemption. So they can't do it automatically, they have to apply for it. And the, the kinds of things that would be eligible for exemption are operations like this. Large area agricultural monitoring. Now, those are fancy words for saying you've got a very large farm and you want to check the, the crops that are way the heck down the, the other end of the world. Yeah, you should be able to do that. Um, if you have an advanced certification, you're familiar with your area, you have good procedures for doing that, and all the rest. So, large area agricultural monitoring, power line or pipeline inspections, or in the future, probably tomorrow, cargo operations with regular or standard flight paths. Now, when applying for an exemption, the pilot, or more likely the flight company or organization that uh, the pilot is working for, must do the following things. They have to identify the operational area or the flight path, whichever makes sense for the operation. They need to identify the requested date range. And that could be a, you know, a full year in the case of, say, uh, an agricultural application, or it could just be a couple of weeks for a pipeline inspection. Um, they need to justify the need and the benefit for flying beyond visual range. Why don't you have a visual observer all the way down your field? Well, sorry, don't have enough of those. You need to provide procedural details uh, and have those in place uh, to, to ensure the operation is safe. So checklists, uh, checking of for, for aircraft in the area, things like this. And you need to reapply for an exemption on a periodic basis so it doesn't renew automatically. When your date range is over, you have to reapply. Second last topic, 4.4, autonomous functions. Autonomous functions are capabilities of drones to follow flight paths based on internal drone software rather than direct immediate inputs from the pilot. And these include selfie patterns, follow me tracking, obstacle avoidance like what the SkyDO2 does, um, and even cruise control vectors where you set a direction um, and an altitude for your drone and, and it flies in that path while you do camera work and all the rest of that. 
So these autonomous functions are permitted only when there is no risk of injury to bystanders or interference with manned aircraft. So regular rule there. The pilot must be able to interrupt autonomous functions at any point and take control of the drone. Now, that might sound sensible and easy, but if you think about it, some of these functions, and I'll, I'll talk about the follow me function, they're designed and advertised by drone companies as, you know, oh yeah, you're gonna be having this drone follow you on your motorcycle when you're, you know, up and down hills and through trees and all the rest of that. Well, I don't, honestly, I don't think that's safe. When you're, fly, when you're driving a, a motorcycle or, or doing any of these other functions that they're always showing in these ads, you are not keeping track of what your drone's doing. If there's another drone in the area or there's a, an aircraft coming, you're not operating that safely. So I'm saying, no, you can't do that unless you are able to take control. Now, maybe you have a visual observer and that would solve it, in which case, well, I don't know how much use these, these functions are. But anyway, um, my point is, is that the pilot must be able to interrupt the autonomous function. And the very last rule here is that, again, because these autonomous functions are not able to react, or I don't think they are able to react to moving objects like rapidly approaching aircraft, I'm saying that autonomous functions must be limited to a maximum altitude of 30 meters. Last but not least, 4.5 RC Aircraft Clubs. RC Aircraft Clubs have a well-earned reputation worldwide for safe and controlled flying. RC Aircraft Clubs may apply to the regulatory agency to be officially recognized. Club rules must meet regulatory agency safety requirements. And club airspace will then be defined in terms of a ground footprint and a maximum altitude. And that maximum altitude may be, if they need it, it may be approved to be over the usual 120 meters. This is because some of these ginormous aircraft these clubs fly actually are safer at higher altitudes than down close to the ground. Now, providing they follow club rules and are flying in the club airspace, members of official RC aircraft clubs do not need to hold drone pilot certification and they do not need to register their RC aircraft, regardless of how ginormous they might be. Flights outside of the designated club airspace, however, are subject to all the regular drone rules. Well, there you have it the four modules of Dawn's Drone Rules. I want to thank you for taking the time for listening to me, well, drone on, as it were, through these proposed regulations. And I would really love to hear your thoughts on what I'm recommending. Because some of these things are pretty controversial. Remote ID, allowing flights at low altitudes in controlled airspace, flying over people, and now I'm trashing visual line of sight. Yeah, this is blasphemy. But I hope you can see where I'm coming from in these challenges. I've laid out the principles and I've tried to come up with rules that actually meet those principles in a practical way with a good balance between risk and restriction. So bring it on. The good, the bad, the ugly, I welcome all your comments. I only ask that you keep it constructive. Thanks again for your time. Don's Drone Rules, my proposal for a comprehensive set of practical rules globally applicable and sensibly balanced.